We're live. Okay, great. Um, hello, everybody. I hope you're well on this Tuesday morning. Um, if you're in Canada, it's likely it's feeling a little bit like a Monday morning as we're coming off of a long weekend. So I hope everyone is feeling a little bit rested, hopefully um, not feeling too bad after I, the big storm that we had here in Ontario um, and Quebec. So I hope that everyone is um, okay and, and hasn't been hit too hard. Um, I'm very excited today to introduce our guest, uh, who is Michael Enos from TechSoup. Um, so Michael is the Senior Director of Community and Platform for TechSoup Global. And TechSoup's mission is to build a dynamic bridge that enables design and implementation of technology solutions for a more equitable planet. Uh, in his role, Michael directs DevOps, enterprise infrastructure, information and technology security, and software development teams that build and support platform products and services. Uh, Michael earned his MBA from Santa Clara University. And his professional career in tech began in 1996, beginning as a system admin for a Bay Area nonprofit that served adults in need. He transitioned into a role um, as a technical consultant, developing data systems to help measure and track service quality to the individuals being served. And Michael was hired at Second Harvest Food Bank of Santa Clara and San Mateo counties in 2000 to manage tech and information systems. He helped transform the organization into a more effective enterprise using best in class technology to efficiently distribute food, communicate, raise money and measure the food bank's impact. As the CTO, he also worked at a national level with other enterprise food banks on developing IT best practices and standards as part of the Feeding America technology governance team. In his spare time, Michael is a craft brewer, musician, and producer living in Montana. And I would love to talk to you a little bit more about that um, as we get into the interview, Michael. Um, but before we get into things, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. And this land is and forever will be home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Um, as someone of settler descent, I am truly grateful to be able to live, work and learn on this land. And so welcome, Michael. Um, and I would just love to give you the opportunity to uh, let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, thank you for having me. This is a really exciting opportunity. Um, I'm joining from Missoula, Montana, and uh, I too am of settler descent and uh, recently moved here and, um, to this, this, the indigenous land of the uh, Katunaha and, and Salish, um, which is, you know, in this greater region around the Flathead Lake. Um, uh, my family and I are absolutely committed to doing what we can to help preserve this, this incredible heritage that we've been so fortunate to, 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 to be, you know, have an opportunity to to help steward for and, and be a part of it. It's, it's very, it is an active community and we, we look, you know, in peace amongst each other. So, um, you know, I'm very, very grateful to be here and, and be able to appreciate this beautiful, beautiful area. Wonderful. Well, I so appreciate you being here. Um, and I know that our Sparkles, our audience of Spark members are very um, interested in this topic. I think for um, today, I know basically the topic being sort of Nonprofit tech and cybersecurity. Um, and before we get into that a little bit, I would love to know a bit more about your hobbies of craft brewing and um, and your music. So maybe you can let me know um, what instruments you play and what kind of beer you like to brew. Yeah. Um, I'm sort of a multi instrumentalist. Um, I nice. played in prof professional. I played mostly keyboard professionally and mm. bands throughout my life. Um, in uh in uh but so mostly keyboards but i also play guitar i'm a singer songwriter um and i dabble with drums and other types of things i, I enjoy uh, all kinds of music i you know i mean every single type of music i enjoy so um and then in terms of beer um uh the you know that's the same thing you know so i mean i'm sort of <laughs> one of those people who i don't like to listen to the same song twice I don't yeah. like to have the same beer twice. You know, I like variety. Yes. So, you know, to me, uh, if, it, if it's a well-made beer in any style, 
Um, there are a few exceptions. I don't like sweet fruited beer that much, but mostly anything else, if it's beer tasting, I, I enjoy it. Nice. I like that. What about sour beers? I've been, I've been liking a bit of sour. <laughs> when I was, um, and we, my wife and I owned a, a microbrewery for a while in Santa Cruz, California, and we specialized in uh, loud aged beer. And we, we were fermentologists, and so we grew on a culture in our land. We had sort of a hobby farm, and so we sort of you know, grew in cultures and got into fermentation, and that ended up with you know, beer and cider and all kinds of other fermented products. And so we ended up making wild beer, and uh, that's kind of what was cool. Nice. So you're a pretty fun person to have around at a party. You'll bring the beer and you'll bring the music, and and sort of things will fall into place. <laughs> yeah, as long as, as long as it's a good batch of beer, and I'm gonna, you know, <laughs> yeah, my, my, my voice is my voice is behaving. <laughs> that's fair. Oh, that's very cool. Um, so, Michael, I would love um, if you could share a little bit in your words about just how you were drawn to the nonprofit sector. You know, it's, it's some, kind of an interesting story because um, I did my undergrad work in philosophy um, mm. in, uh, at, at UC Santa Cruz, and I was studying the work of Michel Foucault, who is a famous French philosopher who studied you know, all kinds of things, power, a lot of power mm. dynamics in the history of systems of, um, you know, marginalized uh, populations. And so um, when I got my degree, uh, number one, there was no real job openings for philosophers. And right. so I, I went straight, I went, I went into social work and um, I was, I didn't come from a tech background, but I was a hobbyist. It was one of my other hobbies. At that time, that was a hobby of mine. And so what I realized pretty quickly doing social work, that there weren't a lot of ways of understanding what we were doing and the outcomes of what we were, mm. you know, that we were working with. And I was working with adults with developmental disabilities, you know, helping to get them out of state hospital systems. And it was really important for us to understand the impact of what we were doing. So I just started, you know, developing systems to measure that. And then next thing you know, I'm, you know, just said, hey, there's a gap here, there's a niche here, and this is a way that I can contribute to the sector. You know, I can use these tech skills. Right. And so did you learn the tech skills on the job? Yeah. I yeah. mean, I had them, I learned them. So, uh, you know, being, being an autodidactic, you know, I, I just sort of like to learn things on my own. It's my, my mode of learning. Although, you know, obviously I went to, you know, uh, grad school and, you know, had that modus of learning, which I adapted to as well. But if I'm doing but the tech, I've always been able to sort of just self, uh, self-teach by, you know, I enjoy reading and I enjoy researching and I enjoy that kind of stuff. So, you know, to me, and then I had access to a lot of, you know, great tools and things because um, in Silicon Valley, where I worked as a CTO, we, we had partnerships with a lot of the major tech companies. And so I had access to be able to try things and they donated things to us. And, and that's how I got to know TechSoup. So I would get things from TechSoup and say, oh, good, but now I'm going to optimize this and, and figure out how to use it. And so, um, you know, TechSoup and, you know, and also just where I was at being privileged as I was. I was able to have an opportunity. So it's, it's a great, you know, sort of just luck and, 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 and privilege I was able to develop those skills. That's very cool. And so what has sort of kept you in the sector? I mean, I know that you sort of developed these, this technical experience and we were chatting a little bit before we hopped on the call around um, mm-hmm. just sort of the, the, the interest in maybe making the world a better place. And so I'd love if you could t- tell us a little bit more about What's keeping you in this sector? Well, you know, the, you know, I think that, you know, for me, tech is not, it's not been about tech. It's always been about technology is about, you know, it's, it's a tool. It, it's something that, you know, we use as humans, you know, that we've developed as humans to be able to do things in, in different ways and in innovative ways. And so, um, you know, and that's the way I, you know, I approach technology, not, not just because it's, it, it's fun to play with, it's because it actually can be an impactful tool. And um, if used, but it can be used for good, it could be used for bad. And, you know, I decided that I wanted to, you know, um, uh, be, be part of the solution and not part of the problem, so to speak. You know, there's a lot of things that people are using, using tech for that aren't, you know, as, as we'll, you know, discuss during the course of this interview, I'm sure, that um, are not helpful, you know, in terms of progressing in civil society and making the world a better, both better place, mm-hmm. you know, and a more civil place and a more equitable place. 
And so to me, being on that side of, of the equation is, is what keeps me in, in the sector as opposed to um, doing something else, you know, with, with my skills. Right, okay. And so you've been a part of the nonprofit tech world for some time now. And I think that we're all pretty well aware that technology can change very quickly. And so I'd love to know um, if you've seen any sort of trends or changes in the way that organizations use technology, particularly in the last 10 years? Yeah, well, you know, of course, there's been this, you know, dramatic shift from, you know, on-premise monolithic sort of systems, you know, that were then managed behind the firewall, right? So, you know, we used to go into an office and we used to, you know, log into a network that was protected. And if you were, if you're traveling or needed access to things outside of the office, you'd have to use, you know, VPN, and then you would get, that would, you know, just get behind the firewall that way. Um, you know, that's all shifted and, and disrupted completely in the last 10 years to, to the point where, you know, that's not even advisable for organizations to do that. And, you know, mm. it's, it's much more advisable to have a strategy where you, you know, have, or, you know, have systems secured in a cloud where they're not highly customized and configured for your own tailored needs, you know, they, they, these things are not cost effective anymore, they're not efficient, and they're not secure. And mm. so, you know, that's been the, been the most dramatic shift. And of course, since the pandemic, what we've seen is the shift to remote workforce, which has brought and challenged a lot of people in a lot of unique ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for when, when we, what tech, when the pandemic happened, Zoom, you know, which, which TechSoup is fortunate to have a relationship with, with, with a lot of these companies, Cisco, Zoom, and we just saw this huge, huge need, you know, for people to, um, you know, to, to leverage those tools. You know, once they moved, we moved into work, a, a remote workplace, it was, it was what So we had we had to shift a lot of our resources just to help people, you know, adapt as as mm -hmm. you know as, as in the sector to, you know, using these these remote tools and um, and securely. And the other thing, and now what we're doing is we're sort of saying, okay, well, how do we optimize that? So now what we're seeing is a shift towards, you know, the cybersecurity is the other large trend that we've seen. We've seen, you know, a, a shift towards, you know, the, the the need for spaces in the cloud to be secure and, and for right. people to understand how to configure the tool. Because they know, don't necessarily come configured for security out of the box. You, know, right. you kind of really have to, you have to kind of optimize them and say, okay, how am I going to, you know, tweak this so that it actually meets my security policies and, and it's secure and enable MFA and, you know, because they kind of come sort of, you know, vanilla out of the box. And mm -hmm. you know, get Office 365 or Google for nonprofits or whatever it is. Right. And then when you start com combining tools, it's like if I'm using Zoom through an integration, is that secure right. or whatever? And I think one thing that I've seen a bit, and I don't know if you have too, but is organizations sometimes picking like, uh, three or four different programs when really they could just be using sort of the Microsoft suite or the Google suite. And I, I'd be interested to know just sort of some of the, the challenges that you're seeing sort of small organizations facing right now when it comes to that, that optimization. Yeah, I think that, you know, it is, there's this, you know, plethora of, you know, tools available on the cloud. And, and a lot of times you could start with a free trial. And I think that one of the, and, you know, and then you, you know, you, you, one of the challenges that, People get into sometimes is the um, you know that they don't have a centralized IT department because they're small they're small organizations. So what they have is you know just a group of people you know essentially, and some may have more uh, aptitude or, or, or capacity to be able to understand you know how to use these tools than others. Um, and then and then some might be more challenged you know with 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 adapting to a new tool. And so you've got and it's just because of different types of people people are different. Some people you know, don't want change, you know, and some people like change, you know, so, so if you put this, those, those three, you know, five, 10 people in the room together, and you've got this access to things like free tools and stuff, mm -hmm. you're going to end up with a lot of sort of mismatched technology. Um, and then you're going to get into sort of, uh, you know, where does our data live and how do we protect our data? Um, and, and then, you know, and so it's, you know, these, that, this is a real challenge. And this is where, a lot of our workers focus is trying to help organizations understand how to deal with tools to help them, you know, and how to sort of optimize them and, and create standards and best practices and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Interesting. 
And so I know that a lot of, I like how you're saying there's sort of different people working in organizations, some maybe averse to change, some more, more into it. And then I think there's the challenge of just not having time and not knowing what sort of where to prioritize. And so I wonder what advice you might have for individuals or, or groups who are working for organizations who may feel a little behind or not know exactly where to start. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I think that, you know, um, one thing that is sort of a, a mantra that I've sort of, you know, tried to, uh, in, in the organization I've worked with sort of really um, embrace is this idea that, you know, you know, is to look at your business strategy or, you know, your organization's mission strategy, you know, mission uh, business strategy, and then map your objectives, the tech objectives to that, not just, you know, so like if you're, you know, for example, if, if you're going to be, you know, needing to raise a certain amount of money because of a capital campaign, or, you know, you're going to need certain tools to help you with that initiative. Um, if your if your mission is to do humanitarian outreach, you know then 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 look at that and then and then try to understand you know and then think open mindedly about the different ways you could do that not just that are tech oriented but people oriented process oriented and then map the appropriate technology the appropriate tool to that. So the other analogy that I use sometimes is that there's you know a it's like having a, a workshop that has all these different types of tools in it. And, you know, you go out to your garden, you're going to use a different tool for a different job that you have in the garden. You know, you're not going to take a, you know, a backhoe to, to weave, you know, a five foot plot. You know what I mean? You're going to, you're going to bring a smaller tool to do that job. And so I think seeing tech for what it is, you know, that it's just a tool. Um, is helpful in terms of focusing on sort of if you see this, these are the objective, these are the initiatives. Um, now, what tools do I need to get there? And, and, and work yeah. backwards from that and then create a roadmap and say, okay, how do I get there? What's the cost? What's the budget? What's the resources that I'll need? What's the training? What's the change management? And all those factors that go into any sort of um, implementation and deployment of the technology. Mm -hmm. I really like that. You know, it's similar in the way that we would recommend some if a, an organization were to implement sort of a new fundraising strategy, there, it's not just about sort of um, the strategy itself, it's all the things that go along with it. And change management is a big part of that, especially when you're working to introduce something that you've maybe never done before. And um, I think that I love the idea of, of thinking of technology as a tool for your end goal and not sort of the end goal in itself. And I think that is potentially where organizations can get tripped up, especially in the current context where we've been sort of forced into a digital transformation of sorts. <laughs> exactly. 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 And and there's a lot of choices. I mean, it's just there's yeah. so many different, you know, uh, ways. I mean, it, and, you know, you know, we're, we're, we're our architect soup. We're, we're interested. We're just a little bit not like a normal sort of organization from a tech perspective because we we do tech, and so we have access to all these tools ourselves, and we actually do all, we need to know how they all work. So as in our organization, I do the opposite of what I would, you know, maybe tell, you know, or advise another organization to do, which is, you know, standardize more. But at, at TechSoup internally, we don't, because we need to you know, understand and use all these tools. And if I'm on a call with, or, you know, with our Microsoft, you know, donors, we want to use Microsoft products. We're our call with Google, Google donors, we want to use Google products, so, mm -hmm. you know, or, or Aqua. So we, we, we're, but, but that's our job, you know, our yeah. job is to do all those different things. And so that's a little different, but um, I think primarily, I think that it's, you know, and one thing that TechSoup does help organizations do is to uh, understand, like maybe based on the type of work they do, the, the sector they're in, um, you know, the subsector, what is probably, you know, what kind of workforce they have, you know, what might be best, you know, for mm -hmm. them in order to ever try it out. And then, um, because we're, we're, you know, vendor agnostic, you know, obviously, but so we were more interested in doing the right fit for the, you know, for, for what the mission is. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, we can operate that way too, where we, there were, I like the term vendor agnostic and um, what's right for one organization might not be right for another. So I think it's, I think I like how you're taking it back to the strategy and looking at your sort of your business operations and how, how tech might fit in. 
And, you know, since we sort of just briefly talked about it, like since the onset of the pandemic, um, we might as well dive straight into sort of the ideas that we were talking about a little bit before around um, cybersecurity. Because mm -hmm. as you mentioned, there are groups and individuals who don't necessarily want to use tech in the way that we do. They want to use it to inflict harm instead of for good. And so we know that many organizations have experienced sort of an increase in cyber attacks from, from large institutions to governments to even small charities. And so I wonder if we can break this down um, to like the bare bones, like what is a cyber attack, first of all? <laughs> um, well, you know, this is you know, generally when we, when we, I mean, there's what we call, you know, cyber threat activity. I mean, that's sort of, you know, what we're speaking about here. And, that activity kind of breaks down into two broad types. Okay. One which is well, one which is random, um, and the other which is targeted. You know, and so those are really and, and understanding that is sort of important because you're going to have different. Um, you know, some organizations clearly are you know have a potential to be a target, and mm -hmm. because of the type of work that they do, this you know the the you know and and perhaps because of the data that they have, and so. If that's the case, you're going to develop a slightly different strategies than if you're just, you know, maybe going to be subject to random cyber activity, which we're all subject to. I mean, constantly, all of our systems, everything, there's just, you know, internet litter that's just all over the place and, and, mm -hmm. and, and shrapnel that, that we're all getting hit by constantly, you know, and so, and people are using robots to check for uh, vulnerabilities on machines, they're looking for data, mm -hmm. they're knocking on doors. You know, there's a lot of knocking on doors. Okay? Right. And they're not done by they're not done by humans. You know, <laughs> they're done by robots. And so, you know, you have to protect against that, right? And so there's you know ways of doing that. But then there's also, you know, individuals and state actors who mm -hmm. intentionally go after certain um, targeted uh, data or individuals because there's something of value and, and they know that you know, or something that they want to do because of uh, some other type of political or, or financial intent. And okay. so that's going to be a different strategy slightly from the cyber, from purely a cyber um, security perspective. But that, that's sort of what we're talking about here. Is in a, in a attack is normally what we call an incident. So, okay. you know, so all these things are happening all the time. So if there's, you know, what happens occasionally is that there's a vulnerability that's found by a robot. Um, or if somebody clicks on a malicious link in an email by accident, um, machine scan, something like that, then that could generate a cyber incident. And this is why, you know, I'll maybe go into this a little bit later, but it's one of the most important things that organizations can do is to have an incident response policy so that they understand exactly what to do when that happens and how to how to communicate, how to respond, you know, what the protocol is, who to contact. Um, that's like, you know, all the things that are actually policy oriented and mm -hmm. that's probably the most, most important um, in terms of, of, other than the tools and the things that we use to protect our systems. Interesting. So, you know, when you hear sometimes, uh, I won't name oh, any one, 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 one thing, there's, oh, yeah. there's another, there, there's another differentiation that, that's really important is that an incident doesn't always involve what's called a breach. So an incident could occur and then it not actually, um, but it's really, this is really important uh, sort of facet of this because a data breach will, you know, kind of like at some, at some point the decision tree moves into two different directions and if there's a data breach, you have, you know, you need to contact legal and you need to find out to understand the impact, who's been affected by that. Incidents kind of, you know, incidents are just things like, oh, you know, I, you know, I've got a virus on my, you know, somebody messed up my computer, but it, there was no data that was breached or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So that's why having a plan is really good. So then you can know what to do when these things happen, understand the difference, do the forensics, you know, look at the logs and then decide what to do as a result of that. You know, it's funny, that's exactly where I was going. I was say, going to say I wasn't going to name any names of any particular vendors, right. but there's sometimes a, a database, a company who, who sells databases or manages databases will alert their mm -hmm. users that there's been a data breach. And so what do you do in, in that instance? If, if um, let's say it's your fundraising database software and you're alerted that there's been a data breach. Um, there, there's, a, there's, there's some sort of steps um, that are involved that, you know, and I would, you know, recommend that 
organizations, you know, look to guidance by NISC and, and SANS.org or, you know, whatever, you know, regionally in their area, you know, the, the sort of best practices. But generally, mm -hmm. what, you know, like with, if an organization needs to understand the impact of, 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 that, of, of the breach and they need to understand who, who's been um, affected and, it, and then how, how does that impact their privacy policy and then also how does, you know, how to communicate that. And, um, and it's better to be transparent. You know, and we've yeah. learned that from some of the data breaches that have happened, that, that, that the more transparent that you are, the more apt you are to be, number one, to have brand um, forgiveness mm. uh, and for your reputation to stay intact. Because it's not really necessarily what happens, it's how you respond to what happens. Mm. We all know, we've seen the biggest players in the world be hacked, you know, and so, um, and I think that it's, and it's, in some ways it's, in, it's not a matter of, you know, if it's going to happen, it's a matter of when it's going to happen when, yeah. and how prepared you are. You know, so so I think that having you know, uh, getting consensus with your executive team about if look and, and and also setting expectations like as much as you protect it, try to protect everything. You know, this is probably going to be an let me an incident, possibly a dangerous. How do we prepare ourselves in case that happens, and and how do we ensure that we're transparent? We don't try to hide it. We contact the individuals. We let them know what happened. Um, we, you know, perform remediation as soon as possible. We learn from it. We, we use that as an opportunity as a learning organization to improve what we're doing. And then also use that as, um, and then once you understand the impact, you know, communicate it to, to the users in, 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 a, in a way and then do whatever form of remediation you need to do in that regard from a legal perspective, it has to happen. Mm. Like that's uh, like a life lesson. It's not about what happens to you, but it's about how you respond to it, right? <laughs> right. I think it's either, you know, the, you know, I've said this for a long time, but the only way to avoid tragedy is to be one. So, you know, I think that essentially things are all going to happen now. Offensive things are happening in life, happening to people, happen to, you know, and that happens in your work. And so it's really about how to respond. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've kind of talked about, like the the difference between the incident and the breach, but what damage can it do? Like if if you have a data breach, like what 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 are what are you but what's at risk here? Yeah, well, I mean, well, you know, first and foremost, it's going to create disruption. You know, it's going to be, <laughs> you know, it's going to disrupt the workflow, and it's going to do things like, uh, if you, and then as a result of that, you're going to have potential loss of revenue. Um, you're going to have. Uh, a lot of just people doing things that you know are outside of the daily practices, um, and you're going to be spending a lot of late hours trying trying to correct and remedy things, uh, trying to restore for backups. You're going to be that's going to be it's very disruptive. Yeah, but you know more importantly, other than that, is is brand reputation. I mean, I think that you know, ultimately, you know the you know if you're if there's if there's a really severe data breach or even a severe incident. It could really do damage to to, to your organization's reputation. And so mm. there's more directory sort sort of risk um, and loss of trust, you know, mm. in, in in the community that you're serving. I think is 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 probably that that's obviously that's more impactful than just you know business disruption. Right. Um, and you know, but also could hurt your mission ultimately. And so that's what mm. is, is is really what we're trying to avoid here. Right. And, you know, you've talked a little bit about the fact that some organizations may be more, more vulnerable than others for a targeted attack based on maybe like the politics of that mm -hmm. sort of surrounds their mission or are there other things that could make an organization vulnerable? Like, could you maybe talk about that a bit? Yeah, I mean, when we, I mean, you used the right word, vulner, vulnerable, and, and essentially, you know, we all have vulnerabilities, um, but I think that when it comes to the tools that we use um, and the humans that are using those tools, you know, those are the two types of vulnerabilities that we have, right? We've got mm. the systems, you know, and, you know, we have, you know, something's not, if you don't have software that's updated, if you're not using, um, you know, encryption or if you're not using, you know, if you're in a public Wi-Fi, you're not using, um, you know, if, you know, VPN or something like that, you know, those, you know, you can become vulnerable and you can, you could, you know, I think having, you know, awareness, um, you know, of, you know, what makes, a, what, what makes you vulnerable and, if our, you know, that's just a scary thing. I mean, we kind of know that from the human perspective, like, you know, how am I going to be vulnerable 
you know, sort of it's situational and environmental circumstances, but we have to think about the tools that we use in that particular context. What makes them, you know, where, where, how did, how did they become vulnerable? And also, um, as humans, what, how are we vulnerable? Are we vulnerable to things like social engineering attempts that happen through phishing campaigns on email? You know, what, you know, where are, where's my Achilles heel in terms of falling yeah. for the email that looks like it's coming from my executive director, right? And saying, oh gosh, you know, I really want to please my executive director. So I'm going to respond right away to her about this request to get gift cards, you know what I mean? Right. Or something like that, right? And so you, you know, you have to, like, that's the way that we're, we're vulnerable. And it's not, and like I said, it's, you know, we're vulnerable from a people process and a tech orientation. And understanding that and it is, is, is really important if we if we want to you know have a secure environment that we're working in. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, it's, it's people who are using the tech. So I think by putting that front and center, it's not just systems and technology. People is really fundamental to how how this works. That's it's a really interesting perspective. Um, and I've seen yeah, those I mean, fishing. Some of the largest, some of the biggest breaches that we've had, you know, for the most like you know were the result of humans, you know, doing you know being fooled by you know some sort of uh, you know social engineering attempts, you know. And I'm going to go into exactly. I could go into examples, but I think you know you, you get the point. Yeah, I was think I was thinking that even that example you shared around the gift cards from like a, a, a an email that looks as a bit of a strange request, but it's coming from a, from an email address that you trust like that. It's all about yeah how how you're how you're gauging those kinds of sort of phishing scams, I guess. I mean, it's too bad that we have to be always kind of cautious, you know, when we're using the tools. But it's sort of like you know when we get into our car, we put on a seatbelt. You know, we don't think twice about it, right? So. I think it's it's a lot about sort of you know, over time people you know sort of can de can develop the practices and behaviors um, and and I think that that is really you know sort of that's I mean that, that's half the equation there it's half mm -hmm. it's half of it it's just as just as important as you know hardening your systems. Nice. And so, what steps can an organization take today to start getting? themselves into a better position to, to fend off any uh, cyber threats? I mean, there's, you know, this, this, there's, you know, the standard like five things, right? So there's, you know, uh, you know, ensuring that you have MFA because I, one of the, one of the, the largest groups of incidents that occur is because of something called privileged access management um, with PAM, they, you know, in, in the field we call that, but essentially what happens is that somebody is trying to gain access to like elevated permissions within you know a system and so what they do is they you know try to hijack somebody's credential mm. now the moment that you have 2fa or mfa in place you know an you mfa know, being um mfa being factor authentication. great yeah sorry about that yeah and so um yeah please if i or out an acronym, please correct me. Um, no but way. yeah, so basically having two factors at least, you know, which is, and a factor is something you know or and something you have. That, that factor is not just two different things that you know. It's gotta be like one thing that you physically have and that's why, you know, you have your physical, you have your phone, so that's why we send it to that because that's something physical that you have, which you know is your username and password. You know, and, uh, uh, you know, so this is one of the most, Important fundamental things that's been developed um, in in the last you know, ten, ten years or so in terms of security to mm. to ensure they basically to protect against you know somebody gaining elevated access because once somebody gains elevated access within your email system or, or your finance application or whatever then they can do whatever they want to do. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing is you know, but then if if there's a, an incident, um, one of the most important things that's you know, the needs to be in place is a disaster recovery plan and disaster that disaster recovery tools, meaning, and that's what you're trying to do there is protect against data loss. And um, so if you, even if your system gets completely trashed, then you, you, you know, you have to have a mechanism to be able to restore them. Otherwise you will lose um, the data and that, and that could be very, very disruptive. Obviously, if you had to somehow regenerate paper trails and like that might be impossible for a lot of there is no paper trail, right? Right. So there's basically just, you know, there's just data. And so um, the other, you know, that, that sort of laundry list is um, is basically having good endpoint security. Like 
because you're, you know, we were, especially now that we're in a more of a remote workforce, that having the, you know, um, ensuring that the endpoints, whether they're mobile phones, you know, laptops, you know, people's computers at home, whatever it is, that those endpoints are, you know, have, have protection on them, that they're checked, that they're updated, you know, all of those things. And then um, the, two, the two last things, which are more sort of on the process side, is security awareness training. I can't stress enough, as I mentioned earlier, that no matter what, how good all this other stuff is that you have in place, it, you know, it, it just takes somebody who just was sort of like, you know, um, not really, you know, you know who's made, made, who made a human mistake, you know, essentially. And so the more aware we are about what's happening in terms of security um, and you know, the ramifications of, 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 you know, of that um, is super important. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, having an incident response plan. Mm -hmm. That is super critical because you, you need to somehow be prepared because you just don't know, you know, what's going to happen. And, and, you know, and then you have to be able to be able to respond quickly and effectively and efficiently without panic when something goes happen. Right. You know, at what I'm thinking of as you sort of go through the list is that with the more technologies that we're using, it feels like the more vulnerabilities we may have in sort of the, the, like if you're taking on, you're using SurveyMonkey and then you're using Eventbrite and you're using all of these different things, you may want to consider how that, like how all of those pieces could sort of where the, where they connect and where the, the gaps or the vulnerabilities might lie. That's a good point. I mean, it, it is, it's definitely an argument for, you know, having more, you know, you know standard centralized sort of systems um, because it's easier administratively to manage it, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. ultimately, and I think that, you know, it's there's so that you have to weigh the pros and cons of having flexibility to use, you know, all these different things versus, you know, the the efficiencies and, and you know, of administrative efficiencies of standard education. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so are there any longer term strategies you've seen organizations be successful with implementing when it comes to sort of um, data security or nonprofit sort of tech and transformation in general? Yeah, you know, I, I think that um, I always think it's worth the investment to have a third party organization, you know, somebody, who, you know, people who do this, you know, all day long, uh, come in an organization and do it, do it an audit, a third, you know, like a security audit, a third party security audit, and then provide recommendations, find gaps. Um, and it's a little bit more of something, uh, it's a longer term thing. I mean, this is something people should do like after they sure they got their basics covered. Mm -hmm. um, and because you, you really want to be leveraging a, a, a consultant to to do, you know, to find the more nuanced things within the organization that are, that are potentially at risk. And it's sort of like a risk assessment, especially. As well. Right. And so, you know, and when, when, if you're trying to advocate for that in the organization to like a funder or to your board or to the executive team, I think in the context from a business perspective, it's about risk. And so oftentimes with the tech person says, you know, kind of approaches from the tech side and say, look, we need a security assessment because I need to know what tools to use to protect the organization. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the person on the other side is going to say, well, you know, well, then just protect it, you know, like figure it out, tell me what you want. But, but if you if you approach it from like perspective of, um, look, we really need a third party risk assessment um, for, like, which will help in the context of your insurance, it'll help from a mm -hmm. business perspective and a, and a planning perspective. Then you, from that, you can lay out a roadmap and of, of strategies and initiatives based on the recommendations and the gaps. And it puts the person who's advocating within the organization sort of out of the picture a little bit because now right. it's somebody else who can come in and basically make those recommendations. So it's not just, you know, sometimes I think when you're uh, the, the techie in the organization or the person who's advocating for something, you kind of feel like nobody's listening to me, you know, because they don't see how important this is. But, you know, when you have other people, sometimes it helps to have the reinforcement from um, a third party consultant, and also because sometimes we don't know what we don't know either. Mm -hmm. so I learn things. I learn things every single day, and I've been doing it for a long time. Yeah, I think it's it's the clarity and the education thing too. I mean, we actually did here at the fundraising lab. We did a risk assessment a, a year or so ago mm -hmm. when we were trying to get our house in order, and yeah, there was things on that assessment I had never heard of before and never considered. And I think it's it's 
while I work in this space a little bit, I, I just was not aware of them at all. And it was kind of that education piece that is that has now serving me in my work with our clients as well. So I think um, it'll help for the organization down the road to invest in that, um, but also in sort of the accidental techie or the, the techie in the organization, um, their professional development too. And I love how you've sort of learned your, a lot of your tech skills um, sort of on the job. So I think that that's um, something that I hope um, our audience can sort of look to as, as a path forward, because I think sometimes um, um, for me personally too, I think it was, where do I fit in this sector? And it's kind of, I work primarily with sort of um, nonprofit or fundraising databases and their online giving tools. But um, yeah, it's kind of finding a niche that that's both interesting to you and, and useful. So, so I appreciate you sharing sort of all of, of your wealth of knowledge, but also your, your history and how you got here. And, you know, I'd Absolutely. love to know, I'd love to know a little bit more about how TechSoup can help um, organizations looking to improve their cyber cybersecurity practices or their overall sort of technological capacity. Yeah, great. Well, there's a couple. I mean, we have, if you're a TechSoup member, um, if you're not, then I encourage you to become a TechSoup member and then really to communicate to the audience to, um, you know, join TechSoup as a member and and um, and then look through our, our, our catalog, essentially, and our services that we offer. Um, we have we have services, you know, and, and we also have materials like uh, blogs and webinars that we, we, we conduct on cybersecurity specifically. So there's opportunities for learning through courses. Um, we launched recently a, a specific community-based membership program called Quad, quad.org. And the focus of Quad is we're gonna be doing sort of specialized membership-based focused areas in the sector. Uh, one is that we're focusing on during the, the launch of Quad is uh, uh, food uh, food security and the other is cyber security so um we're sort of those are the two areas so that's that's going to be another resource and we're looking for well, that's sort of more like a community sort of we're, we're creating communities to help you know people learn, learn from each other and grow together in this space and then of course text you know text work has a whole bunch of resources available to people as well as products that are donated by you know uh, Mm -hmm. uh, Bit Defender, Avast, you know, uh, Norman Life Lock, and we have we other types of you know products that people could you know employ, and and the materials and tools for them to be able to um, uh, understand how to use them and optimize them. Amazing, that's great. Good to know. Yeah, absolutely. Check out TechSoup.org. Um, tons of amazing resources, as Michael just shared. Um, and so I just want to thank you so much for joining us today, Michael. And I will. I know we want to see if there's any questions from our audience, but um, we will absolutely make sure that we share um, links to your Twitter and your LinkedIn and um, links to TechSoup um, on our on the site and on the post after this goes, or now that it's live, we will make those available under the caption. Um, and yeah, is there anything else that you'd like to share before we get to get to questions? Uh, no, this has been a great opportunity. I really, really appreciate uh, being here. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and so I'll I'll give us a minute just to see if there's anything. So it doesn't look like there's anything at the moment, but uh, Michael, I'm wondering wondering if you uh, might be willing to um, answer a question if it comes up after on our uh, on our uh, Spark chat room. Absolutely. Just awesome. For anything on to me, and I'd be happy to uh, do what I can. Awesome. Appreciate that. Cool. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll see. Well, I guess we'll see you later then, Michael. Uh, th thanks again, and uh, take care. And I look forward to uh, seeing you guys in the future down the road sometime. Thank you very yeah. much.